Hello amigos, Dr. Lebrinicki. Today I'm going to help you get ready for your CSET World Languages Subtest 1 and this video focuses on linguistic terms. Uh, my background is as a Spanish teacher and so the majority of my videos prepare people to get ready for Spanish exams but this video could help anybody preparing for a different world language as well as Spanish. All right, vamos a empezar aquí. Okay, so what we need to know for the first subset, you're going to be analyzed on nature of language, language use, applied linguistics, language structures, error analysis, contrastive analysis, and sociolinguistic and pragmatics. So this first video, I just went through a practice test and came across 40 terms that I thought that would be helpful to get ready for the test. And then I've got another video after this. There's going to be practice activities that you can try. Uh, but um, for this video, I've also included a Quizlet down in the comments section, so check that out and practice that way. But I'm just going to go through and explain these 40 different terms and um, see if you can come up with your own examples as well. All right, so let's get started here. Morphology or a morpheme, what does that mean? That's the smallest unit of a word that still retains meaning. So let's take a look at examples. So maybe if I take a look at the word outgoing, I could break it into three morphemes. Out go in each each three of those parts has a significance on its own um, phonology and phonetics um, the relating of sounds and making meaning in language and then we've got syntax the arrangement of words and phrases to make sentences so how is that different between um, the target language in english or spanish and english or the language that you're studying or hope to teach Semantics, the meanings of words, phrases, or sentences. And think how these four concepts could be applied to the language that you're trying to teach. All right, then we've got productive rule of language using patterns to create new words. Um, worker um, could originally be work, um, do, to doer, or adding an er, or there could be a new word like text, texter, somebody who texts, um, things like that. Um, then we can take a look at deep structure versus surface structure. So I can take a look at two sentences here. I am a teacher, or we could say it a different way, my job is to teach. So the deep structure would say that those sentences are basically the same. They've got the same meaning. Um, but on the surface structure, it's going to look at the sentences part by part and say that those sentences are different. So when we look at translating between two languages, Typically, we can go from, we want to use deep structure, and there could be more than one way to translate between languages, but the surface structure is going to look at um, going word by word. Okay, then we want to talk about language families. So if we take a look at Spanish and English, they have some similarities because they come from the same language family, the Indo-European language family. But they also have some differences because Spanish comes from a Romance, language and English is a Germanic language. So that kind of explains some of the similarities and differences. And again, if you're looking at a different language like Chinese or Japanese or Arabic or Russian that you want to teach, um, make sure that you know some information about that. Okay, then we've got some things like diachronic and synchronic. It says diachronic is the study of how languages change over time and synchronic is the study of a language at a specific point in time. Um, now this could relate to human geography and how do languages change throughout time and um, history could be mapped based on language usage as well. So that could be a way that languages um, relate to other subject matters. All right, up next we've got lexical language changes. They explain how words change meaning or preference over time. Again, this involves history of languages and it's important to know um, in different places why they might use different words it has to do with geography, human geography, many different uh, factors there. Um, umlaut is a German word, but what it really means is a change in vowel sound. And so in English, we can take a look at why goose, geese, mouse, mice, foot, feet have irregular singulars and plurals. Uh, how about a phoneme? Um, it can be a language sound. Um, notice like the K sound makes a hard k sound like cart, cat, kite, kit. Okay, so linguists are going to say that those have the same sounds. Um, then branching off from that, a small variation is an allophone. So it's the variation in these phonemes. 
So the C can actually have different sounds like cat or fact, even though they sound very similar, a uh, true linguist might say that these sounds are technically different using this term called an allophone. All right, then let's take a look at a uh, phonemic split. Uh, one phoneme becomes two, so depending on dialects of how people speak. So I would say bath, but other me people might say bath and spread it out a little bit. Or I might say planet, others might say planet, or bad could become bad. So you can hear how those vowels are splitting, they're being spread out in some dialects. Um, let's take a look at some other examples where um, two vowels might merge. Um, so in British English, people might say caught. Um, but I might say caught, and other people might say Harry Potter, but I might say Harry Potter, and um, so some people might have them as um, two phonemes. I might um, merge them into one phoneme depending on my dialect or my pre uh, preference for pronunciation. Um, how about borrowing? This is going to be common and again has to do with languages being in context of one another and world history, human geography. But um, borrowing languages from another language, such as salsa, puma, coyote, um, common lang uh, words that we use in English. Um, how about a euphemism? It's a more polite way of saying a word. So I might, instead of saying somebody died, I might say he passed away, which is a, more, a little bit more polite. So that's a euphemism. How about folk etymology? Language change due to historical forces or social interaction. Okay, kind of complex. Here's an example that I came across. So female. It's kind of a combination of the Latin word femina and the English word male, female, femina, male, female. Uh, metaphor, you're probably familiar with this one, but saying something is like, so, or excuse me, saying something is something else. So if I say something is like something else, that's a simile, but is something else, metaphor. She is a night owl. Life is a highway. And those could also be idiomatic expressions that we're going to take a look at a little bit more in depth in just a few moments here. Uh, how about a taboo? You've probably heard that one. How about an example from language? So it's an offensive term. I want to be careful with these not to offend anybody, but in different places they've got different slang, they've got different taboo words. Anyways, in Spain we use the word coger to catch. Voy a coger a autobús. I'm going to catch the bus. But in Mexico that is a swear word. We, we don't want to use that word in Mexico. We want to think of a different word. Pragmatics, the study of language and context, um, such as conversation and writing. So how do we use how do we use the language appropriately? Pragmatics. Um, discourse analysis, a research method for studying pragmatics based on social context. So uh, many different things come into play when we think about um, a social context and language usage. Um, could be education, um, could be our audience. All right, commands, ordering someone to do something. So I'm gonna work on more videos to explain commands a little bit more in depth. So um, stay tuned for those in the future. Um, but comer to eat, a Spanish example. Um, I can use come or no comas. Uh, comamos, vamos a comer, comed, no comais, coman. A um, bunch of different things to be aware of when I'm using commands. And as a language teacher, I need to be able to explain those to my students. How about tone? on the speaker or writer's attitude portrayed in the communication. Um, then we got first language acquisition versus second language acquisition. It's important to know um, which language somebody's on and how that's gonna be taught and things that they may understand or need to have explained to them. So typically, uh, first language acquisition is gonna occur, occur from exposure from birth. And then typically when a student gets to school, we're gonna teach them um, reading and writing but um, second language acquisition is kind of a little bit different because typically they're not going to understand that or start learning that until they come to school. And so it's going to be different. They're not going to have that base vocabulary that a first language learner is going to know. And typically might use direct language instruction, especially at the high school level if someone's learning a second language at that time. Okay, up next, it's important to be aware of second language acquisition theories. So you need to know these things and be familiar with these things. You're going to see them, you're going to use them, you're going to explain them, but grammar translation, direct approach, audiolingual, total physical response, the natural method, the silent way. So I'm not going to explain all these concepts here. Um, if you need more background information on these, I've already created a video 
for other teachers that want to pass the World Languages Pedagogy Praxis exam. And uh, it's about a 26 minute video, so it's pretty in depth. You can check that out and put a link um, up, uh, put a link up here. And it's called Second Language Acquisition Theories is the video that's going to help you with that one. All right, let's continue on here with our 40 terms to help you get ready for the CSET subtest number one. You might be a world language teacher or a Spanish teacher. Um, we've got segmental, a group of vowels or consonants that make up a syllable like morph, all, og. And then how about supra segmental, a significant feature such as tone or pitch that occurs among consonants and vowels. And some people call it musicality of speech. An example can be trusty versus trusty. Trusty, trusty, ending in ee. -E. So um, basically have the same sound, but just slight different pronunciation. And that's going to give a different meaning as well as also a different, different spelling. How about intonation patterns? The rising and falling of speech, especially seen in questions. James, is that you? Diego, eres tu? Versus a statement, you are my friend. Tu eres mi amigo. So notice how in the question I can change the intonation to indicate that it is a question. How about syllable structure? We could have C, V, C, consonant, vowel, consonant, cat, hat, bat, or consonant, vowel, go, me, to, which might be a different format as for a Spanish. We might have C, V, C, gato, mano, niño, because a lot of the words in a lot of the nouns in Spanish end in a vowel, in a, end in O or A to indicate if they're masculine or feminine. How about orthography? Orthography is the correct spelling of words, including accent marks, especially in Spanish or other languages, umlaut in German. All right, inflectional morphology, changing words by adding affixes and suffixes or morphemes. Work becomes worker, trabajar becomes trabajador. So typically if I would look up um, one of these words in the dictionary, um, then the other one is kind of uh, based off of that by adding an affix or a suffix. Okay, these other ones, derivational morphology, morphology, they're similar words, but they might get a different entry into the dictionary. Let's take a look at some examples here. It might have write, or it might have writer, uh, escribir, escritor. All right, how about noun declensions? What does that mean? Changing a noun to add a description, man, men, joven, jovenes. How about syllabaries? So these are more and um, logographic systems, more if you're going to be a Japanese or a Chinese teacher, don't necessarily pertain to Spanish so much, but you ne may need to still describe them, be able to describe them on this test. So syllabaries, syllables that represent symbols that represent syllables of a language. Japanese characters are an example. And the logographic systems use symbols to represent words, and Chinese characters are an example of this. Uh, verb conjugations, changing the endings of a verb to indicate who is doing the action and the verb tense. So we don't have this so much in English, but this is very, very important in Spanish and it's important that we're able to explain this to our students. A nuance, a subtle difference, gray versus light gray. Cohesion, linking a sentence or text together, talking about Martha, then referring to her. Um, idiomatic expression, pero que ladra no muerde. The dog's bark is worse than its bite, meaning someone actually someone appears tougher than he or she actually is. Uh, then we've got honorifics, a title of respect. In English, we might use sir or madam. In Spanish, we might use señor, señora, or usted. And those are our 40 linguistic terms. So that was video number one in the series. Up next, we've got um, world language linguistic practice for the subset one. Then on subtest number two, we talk about cultural analysis. And then in number four, it's, this one is more just for Spanish, the sub, subtest number three, um, Spanish communication. How can you practice reading, writing, speaking, and listening kill, skills? So hopefully if you go through all these videos, that's going to help you get ready for your CSET to become a world language teacher or more specifically a Spanish teacher. All right, gracias por mirar. Thanks for watching. Go ahead, click that subscribe button if you're interested in getting ready for Spanish test prep videos. I am Dr. L. Adios. Ciao.